In 1977, the Pittsburgh Steelers returned to the playoffs for a sixth straight season. Against Denver, they faced a team playing in its first playoff game ever, and a city infected with something called Broncomania. The Steelers had persevered through a long and difficult season. They were well prepared for the crackling intensity of postseason football. The upstart Broncos took an early lead and seized emotional advantage. Pittsburgh was learning what other NFL champions had discovered. The longer you stay on top, the harder it is to remain there. <laughs> Pittsburgh battled back to tie the score at 21 as the fourth quarter began. Now the game would be decided on the tumbling twists of fate. Both teams searching for that fraction of an inch advantage which separates victory from defeat. In 1977, the Denver Broncos got caught up in the winds of destiny and went on to Super Bowl XII, while the Pittsburgh Steelers stayed home. a champion you can lay claim to number one but even in defeat the Pittsburgh Steelers could look back with pride and ahead with promise since emerging from the shadows in 1972 to join the NFL's elite Pittsburgh has won six division titles and two world championships this is the story of the men who stand ready to keep this string intact. Football returns to Three Rivers Stadium and optimism abounds. The struggles of summer are left behind as Steeler head coach Chuck Knoll and his team eagerly await a new season. Even those who have not seen eye to eye in the past forgive and forget, kiss and make up. On a Monday evening in September, Pittsburgh thrilled a nationwide audience as the 1977 season began. Number 64, Steve Furness led a persistent pass rush that brought the San Francisco 49ers down to earth. The entire steel curtain was present. Green, Holmes, Furness, Greenwood, and White fell on the 49ers for a 27-0 shutout. But perhaps the most impressive player on the field wore number 59 and played left outside linebacker to perfection. Jack Ham has been an all-pro six times in his seven-year career, and many consider him football's finest at his position. Flawless technique coupled with natural ability make him the rarest of finds. A linebacker who can blitz, play the run, or cover a pass with equal aptitude. While Ham defeats an opponent with calm precision, the man he plays next to arrives at the stadium
him already angry. By game time, middle linebacker Jack Lambert's ill will has grown into genuine dislike for anyone wearing a wrong colored jersey who happens to end up with a ball. Lambert is a bully on the block, but for all his aggressive behavior, he's not physically intimidating. At 6'4 and a slender 220 pounds, he must use his remarkable agility to overcome those who would restrict his rage. Weights and measures aside, no one fills a hole as thoroughly as Jack Lambert. Lambert has help, however. Pittsburgh defensive backs like number 31, Donnie Shell, love to share the load. Whether coming up to contain a sweep or reacting to the ball and pinning a receiver in his tracks, Mel Blunt, J.T. Thomas, Len Edwards, and Jimmy Allen stick with authority. It is a Steeler tradition to put 11 hitters on the field. All through the glory years, a certain tone has been set. Don't expect to slip through the steel curtain without paying the price. Pittsburgh has refined the art of gang tackling further than six men jumping on a ball carrier. After the initial hit is made, others look for an opportunity to strip the ball away. Thus the Steeler defense manufactures its own breaks instead of waiting for them to happen. It's a black and gold axiom that once the ball goes up for grabs, it usually ends up in the clutches of a greedy stealer. The Pittsburgh defense still has the talent to completely dominate a game. Against the Houston Oilers, they drove the Houston aerial attack underground with a minus 14 yards passing for the day. Interceptions matched sacks as five Houston passes fell to the opportunistic Steelers. While defeating Houston 27 to 10, Pittsburgh created seven turnovers in all, including two outrageous thefts by a defensive end, number 78 Dwight White Shoes. Throughout the playoff years, Pittsburgh's passing game has flown on the strong right arm of Terry Bradshaw. 
The trademarks are a quick release, a hard, tight spiral, and sure hands wading downfield. Number 88, Len Swan. Number 82, John Stallworth are a matched pair of high-wire acrobats swinging from the end of Bradshaw's ropes. During 1977, Swan and Stallworth combined for 99 catches to lead an offense that was constantly ticking like a time bomb. Against the Cleveland Browns, Bradshaw reached back and detonated the most explosive passing day of his pro career. Number 43, Frank Lewis, took his turn on the receiving end for part of the 361 yards and three touchdowns totaled by Bradshaw's aerial extravaganza. Pittsburgh romped over Cleveland 28 to 14, but Terry Bradshaw has never learned how to take things easy. A competitive drive for every last yard leads Bradshaw down dangerous pathways and into pitfalls of pain. Terry Bradshaw knows the difference between pain and debilitating injury. With pain, you just get back up and keep playing. When Bradshaw's left wrist was broken in the season's fourth week, he simply put on a cast and went right back to work, taking snaps, sprinting out, and throwing touchdowns with his good hands. Bradshaw wore a cast for the rest of the season and just kept right on throwing bullets to receivers like Randy Grossman. What's more, he didn't allow it to alter his all-out style of play. Cast or no, Terry Bradshaw could still beat you with guts or guile like luring a contained man to the inside with a play fake, then taking advantage around the end. Bradshaw's courage inspired his teammates all season. And when Cleveland came to town for a rematch, the aerial circus was flying high once again. Stallworth, Swan, and Bradshaw helped defeat Cleveland with another prolific passing day, which totaled 283 yards. While some can measure their worth by statistics, others are judged by the respect of their peers. Pittsburgh's offensive line earned admiration for protecting their injured quarterback as if he were a piece of fine china. The offensive line included a reformed tight end, number 79, Larry Brown, who learned to pass protect like an old hand, and young Ray Penny, number 74, who challenged the starters. 
All in all, it was a good line which promised to get better. Veterans Jim Clack, John Kolb, Sam Davis, and Jerry Mullins clearing the way for an ever-ready runner named Rocky Blythe. Blyer erodes a defense a little bit at a time, like wind and rain. Franco Harris, number 32, simply tears away huge chunks. Harris confounds a defense. It sets out the capture in elusive floating sprite and ends up clinging to a runaway truck. In six NFL seasons, Harris has rattled many ahead and accumulated some impressive numbers. Over 6,000 yards rushing, six playoff seasons with a team that had never made them before he arrived. The first back in NFL history to gain over a thousand yards rushing in postseason play. All this with a blend of power and elusiveness unequaled in the sport. Franco Harris is Mr. Pittsburgh Steel, but in the season's 10th week, Mr. Pitt Panther came home. A media blitz greeted Tony Dorsett and the Dallas Cowboys. The former Pitt Heisman Trophy winner said hello with a first quarter touchdown. Then when all the hoopla died away, an old pro responded to his challenge. Franco Harris counted with 179 yards rushing, the highest single game total of his storied career. Meanwhile, Dorsett moted up and down the line of scrimmage, only to find all avenues of escape blocked. For this afternoon, it was vintage steel curtain, gang tackle, turnover, and takeaway. Defense brought the ball in close, and Bradshaw found his favorite target as Pittsburgh rolled over the soon-to-be world champion. Pittsburgh's 28-13 win against Dallas had all the familiar ingredients, but was spiced with a liberal helping of youth. A bumper crop of young Pittsburgh players like number 21, Tony Dungy, are getting ready to step in and contribute. The opening is very simple now. George, no chroma key in the booth on the opening. During the past six seasons, network television has presented the Pittsburgh Steelers story to the nation. In a pre-game production meeting, an NBC crew goes over the cast of characters. Going down the line, I think you know the Steelers pretty well, Lynn Swan with the breakaway, but we'll isolate a lot on him. The, the other guy that will probably take a lot of looking at is 64, Furness, who had the best game of any of the defensive linemen uh, the last game. How about, a, how about a Steeler, shot of a Steeler fan with a beanie or something? And you want to mention that in the opening? Sure. This is uh, one of the loudest uh, ballparks for roaring, uh, for noise, contains noise, and one of the most vocal crowds. Uh, Just mention the fact that the, fan, the the part the fan plays today. Yeah. yeah. Maybe in the opening, we get a shot of a Steeler fan who's dressed up like a Steeler fan would with the beanie or whatever they wear. Let's get a shot of Noel. All right. Here comes five, a shot give of me Noel a shot now. of Noel. Stand by on five. Ready, five. Here we come. Get that guy out of the way. He's in the way, George. Okay. Get him out of the way. All right. Here's ready, Noel. five. Take five. Well, Noel. All 
Right. All right, take four now. Give me football. Drop your answer. Tighten up four a little bit. Ready to three. Kick off. Take three. Ready for the kickoff. Okay. Let him go. Five. Four. Stand by. Ray is on the two. One. NBC. As they begin the seventh year of their playoff cycle, the Pittsburgh Steelers are not standing still. They continue to change and improve. Hustle and pit. They remain dedicated to the draft, gathering enthusiastic special teamers like Dave LaCrosse, Jack Delaplane, Jim Smith, and Brent Sexton. Whether smothering a return or covering a Roy Girella onside kick, these men bear watching, for theirs is the fresh face of the future. Steeler coaches have already put to use the skills of rookie linebackers Robin Cole and Dennis Winston with the regular defense. Cole, number 56, blitzes like a demon and demonstrates a proper Steeler affinity for the loose ball. Winston exudes raw talent, although his methods sometimes display rough edges. However, as with all gifted rookies, patience and practice can fine-tune abilities already present. Four years ago, linebacker Lauren Taves, number 51, was where Cole and Winston are now. After an education on special teams and spot duty behind Andy Russell, Taves was ready to step in when Russell retired and cover a running back stride for stride. On offense, a rookie runner named Sidney Thornton earned a chance to show why he was called the Thundering Bull at Northwestern Louisiana. Even more impressive was a second-year tight end from Clemson named Benny Cunningham. A third stringer at the beginning of summer camp Cunningham quickly laid claim to a starting position and then aggressively defended it. Cunningham may have solved Pittsburgh's tight end problem for years to come, but it was no accident. This is simply the Steelers' way. Draft quality people such as number 52, Mike Webster. Drill them hard till ready, then fill a need like offensive scent. Webster, Cole, Winston, and Cunningham joining forces with Harris, Ham, Bradshaw, and Swan. A new look blends with the old guard, and the Pittsburgh Steelers roll on. Past glories point the way to even better days ahead as the entire Pittsburgh organization accepts a challenge to maintain the greatness that Steeler fans have come to expect. A town and its team looking forward with optimism to 1978. With unity of purpose, the goal is already in sight. To reach the playoffs for a seventh straight year. After that, the sky is the limit.
all is in readiness for the next chapter in the Pittsburgh Steelers story to unfold. The one man who has been there since the beginning is ready to. And owner Arthur J. Rooney can't wait to get started.